Any true military historian realizes that what actually wins wars is the rifle. The rifle is the tool that makes a country and nation state capable of winning any conflict. Here we see a modernized FG-42. The Germans would have won on both the Eastern Front and the Western Front if they had something representing this type of technology. Here we have an example where many things are represented that they were missing strategically from their reserves. One of the things that you'll notice about the FG-42 is the amber varnish that's used. Um, this varnish was different than the previous varnish used on um, the uh, uh, K-98 bolt-action rifles. I, I believe that that varnish actually exposed them and it let them be visible to the enemy, which essentially made the Russians capable of hitting them at long distances, which they would not have been able to if they had this varnish in the field. Additionally, the varnish's amber hue inspired esprit de corps in the troops. Not only that, we see in this example here that there's an actually illumination device on the front of this rifle, which they were lacking back in the time. Back then, they just mounted torches and lighters to their weapons. The addition of a high-powered illumination device allows the soldier to peer right directly into the enemy's soul. That is true. Now, you see here also that we have an example of one of their late war German helmets here. Now, that helmet was one of the best of the time, or at least regarded as such. And as a result, we've seen multiple other uh, militaries adopt it, such as the Estonian military and Lithuania. I believe also Liberia. Liberia as well. So it goes to show you that German technology still lives on today. Another thing that I think we want to note here is that red dot technology was being developed in the early Weimar Republic of Germany but really didn't manifest until after the war in like around 1947 as we said earlier. Yeah it's definitely a game changer. You know back then they didn't quite yet have EMP weapons which have rendered red dots in this day and age completely useless. Of course. Well, yeah we know it's stupid to put a red dot on your gun as a complete waste of time. I mean an EMP is going to render you useless immediately in the field but in 47 or even 45 or 44 this would have been a complete force multiplier and game changer for any military that could have deployed it. Now, one thing interesting to mention is that if there were, in fact, red dots uh, in 1945, it would have been a very interesting circumstance to observe through the optic a, a red dot that was not actually red, but black and white. That's a very good point, or even at least a sepia when you get into the true color or a chromochrome or whatever they called it back in the yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Probably cigarette burns too. Yeah, absolutely. And so that would have obscured your sight picture, would have made it much more difficult to use the red dot. But I mean, technology has increased a lot since then. The other thing that the Germans really suffered with was they really, there was a lot of these pesky Russians that would get on their tank. They had a hard time getting them off the tank. And if they had the ability to shoot around corners, which this rifle actually does with some really cleverly placed mirrors, they could have actually uh, removed those Russians from their tank in a very effective way. I think they were developing uh, a short a corner shooting device back at the time, I think it was around 45, they called it the uh, get off my tankin. Yeah. I think that was what it was called. Is that, do you remember? Yeah, uh, there were a couple of different models um, and, they, and they actually got pretty creative in their uh, diversification of uh, defensive tactics for defending a, a mobile infantry. Yeah, that's right. And out of uh, defensive tank tactics for an armored unit, one of the lesser known tactics that was highly successful but uh, only used in uh, a specific circumstance would have been this... Uh, it, it was a it was a, a specific weapon known as the Oberdongführer, and this was a large rubber dong that would be extended out of the hatch and rotated around and whipped in a circle. Mm. This would then strike uh, Ruskies in the face, rendering them unable to overpower the tank. You know, they actually made more than one version of that. They also made one called the Kurtz, which was the shorter version, and that was when they really had uh, smaller Russians to deal with, you know, from maybe over far in the east. Yeah, well, they do get short the further east that you go. They do, right, right, right. So the, the Obermegadongführer and the Kurtz, the Omegadongführer, which is weird because you hear Kurtz and Megadong, it really is counterintuitive, but the Germans really always kind of were that way. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, of course, the Germans uh, also were very advanced and unfortunately so with a uh, chemical weaponry. And I believe they were the early predecessors of the uh, WD-40. And they would actually emit this from the top of the turret of the tank, and it would make it so slippery that the Russians would just slip right off. It was kind of like a fun slide, but it wasn't that fun when you got run over by the tank. It's an amazing uh, compound, to be honest. I mean, every rocket engine is derived from technology of WD-40 being used as a primary fuel source in rocketry. Yeah, and even today people forget this, but you can extract WD-40 and boil it down and turn it into a propellant for ammunition if, you know, the time were to come where you couldn't buy ammunition at the store. You could actually use the compound in a survival situation to individually consume it and sustain your own body. Well, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I actually just learned that on the way in. There was a uh, there was a homeless guy up front, and uh, he told me that fact, and uh, I thought it was incredibly insightful, and he gave me a demonstration right out front. This would explain why we've always heard in the legend and lore that the Varmok never had constipation problems, and it might be why they referred to as the uh, the regular army. Fascinating. Fascinating.
One thing that was very common on the Eastern Front of World War II is the Russians liked to use captured German weapons. Even though we mentioned earlier the German weapons weren't exactly as effective as they could have been, however, those complexities of those German weapons tended to evade the average Russian soldier. That's right. It was almost akin to Neanderthals trying to use a newest Apple device. But you know, the Russians just went back to their secondary weapons, clubs, melee weapons, whatever they could use. You know, the Mosin Nagant really was a club that happened to occasionally fire around.